Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by apologizing for this. I had surgery a few weeks ago on eye muscle, and I, I'm going to be wearing this for about another month or so, so my apologies. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences as an inventor and an entrepreneur. Um, I've been a tremendous beneficiary of the Boston ecosystem, and the Boston ecosystem I view as being characterized by great universities, capital, smart people, and a culture of innovation and a culture that doesn't punish failure. So my talk's titled Asking a Better Question, which I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion is the heart of the process of being an inventor. And when my kids ask me what I do when they were small, I would say I'm an inventor. And that they kind of thought that was cool, but they didn't know quite what it was. And uh, I didn't either when I started, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. I've, I've had one job in, in recent memory, not even that recent. In 1978, I worked, until 1978, I worked at Raytheon. And since then, I've started companies and more or less been signing my own paychecks. Um, and the transition, the hardest transition in my life was from having a job to not having one. And since I haven't had one for over 34 years now, I've finally gotten comfortable with it. So this is me in 1970 and finishing my engineering education. And the most amazing thing is when I finished four years of math, which is what engineering education was, then I had no idea what engineers did, and I had no idea what a business did, and I had no idea of the connection between engineering and business. I was really starting with a very clean, clean slate. But I, I really uh, was always a gizmo guy. I enjoyed cracking math problems, and I was always fascinated by the nexus of technology and medicine. Raytheon, you may know, is a very large company. It's Massachusetts' largest employer still. It's a primarily a defense contractor. Back then, it was a multi-billion dollar company. It's a much larger company now, and it's every way an excellent company. It had a micro business, third decimal place business, in medical electronics. Um, it had, in that business, it had very low market share. It was looking to make a name, and I was looking for a job. Uh, it made a major bet on something called a large field gamma camera. So the two applications, the two things in my life I'm going to talk about today, both, both are imaging related. Um, nuclear medicine gamma, ca gamma cameras were invented in 1958 with the purpose of imaging radioisotope absorption in the thyroid. These are some thyroid photos from the early days. You see resolution is low. Images are composed of dots. These are gamma rays that emanate essentially straight up from the thyroid. The more radiation or the less radiation, the more likely or less likely there is a malignancy there. You typically look for nodules that are uh, uh, especially dark or especially light. And these instruments were uh, made of seven photomultipliers. They contain huge amounts of lead shielding, lead collimators, because lensing gamma rays is not possible. This is a 1970s era gamma camera. These were, these were reasonably monstrous machines, but um, were widely used. Every American hospital over a few hundred beds had one, and every year companies like Raytheon came out with a better one. I'm sure it made a difference, but they were better. We'll talk about that a little bit. The basic electronics physics of them are this. A gamma ray that comes straight up is collimated by a lead plate about uh, two uh, two inches thick with very narrow holes. If um, the lead, the uh, a straight up gamma ray, therefore it can image, hits a salt crystal. The salt crystal turns the gamma ray into a uh, spherical wavefront of light, about a thousand photons, which are collected by an array of photomultipliers. And an analog computer computes the x y location with uh, about three or four millimeter resolution as to where that uh, gamma ray came from. So it's a collection of dots. The initial instruments just had seven photomultipliers. Um, the physics of this and the engineering is actually pretty tough. You require absolute stability of photomultipliers, perfect bonding between the photomultiplier and that salt crystal, any drift in the electronic circuits, little amounts of small amounts of drift, um, lead to misplaced points or lead to loss of points or excessive points. So tumors can be induced by miscalibration or by drift of the instrument, apparent tumors. The early machines uh, had seven photomultiplier tubes, had a field of view about this big or so, useful for thyroid but not much else. 
Um, and then over the years, more and more rings of photomultipliers were added to image larger organs, to image liver, to image brain. Um, and uh, by the time I showed up at Raytheon, they were working on an instrument with uh, 91 photomultiplier tubes with a 20-inch field of view that could essentially, for 95% of the population in one scan, uh, look at the whole, the whole torso. There was mar great market interest in this instrument. The problem is, with 91 photomultipliers, keeping all of them in tune was pretty much impossible. And some really smart physicists at Raytheon and in Raytheon's competitors had not really been successful in stabilizing the circuitry. So after a week or two, this is exposure. This is what an image looks like of exposure to a uniform field of radiation. It su simply should look like the same intensity in a hexagon, and it's not. The photomultipliers drift up, they drift down, they break contact, they regain contact with the salt crystal. And this was, in fact, an insolvable problem, and literally on my first day on the job, I was 27 or so, I was 27 years old, the, uh, the bosses in that division of Raytheon were considering shutting down the business, which wasn't great because I just moved to Boston, and I wasn't very happy. You know, newly married, just moved to Boston. This is not good. Um, and I couldn't crack the physics. This physics, these, if those smart guys couldn't do it, I certainly couldn't do it. But instead, I asked the, a different question. Um, and it was, if, if we can't fix the physics, maybe we can make the measurements that show how the instrument is drifted and calibrate those changes out. And these were the relatively early days of microprocessors, so today we would say that's not a terribly innovative thought, but in the 70s it was. And what we would do is if, the, if there were fewer dots in any given square when exposed to a uniform field of radiation, we would simply make the pulse width wider. And what that did was make it look as though the field was uniform. And if there were uh, excessive dots in any square, uh, say square centimeter, we would... Uh, decrease the pulse width, the pulse width that exposed the uh, film that made the overall image. So I got my first patent. Very exciting. I actually became the inventor I had sort of hoped to be back when I was an undergraduate. Um, and the claims here were actually quite narrow. We'll talk about the impact of that in a moment. Um, this was what I just described about uh, if the pulses are too dense, make the if, the if the spots are too close to each other, make the pulses wider, uh, narrower, and vice versa. So we were able to turn this into this. So it's pretty good. It worked pretty well. And in fact, it became a standard of practice. Raytheon uh, had its one patent. Uh, others, other companies developed workarounds. But this idea of uniformity correction became a standard in the industry. Immediately, Raytheon sales doubled. So it was a great success. The company went from uh, a nowhere position in the market to having a very clearly identified technology edge, and I got $100. <laughs> Sales doubled, you know, it was millions, right? And I got $100. And the promise of maybe becoming a vice president of the corporation in 20 years. That was a good promise. This was my boss taking me very seriously. Um, so I quit. And um, my wife, so when did I quit? I quit when my wife was four months pregnant. This was our net worth, which even back then was not a lot of money, and we had a mortgage. So I just quit. And I started a contract engineering company, and that turned out actually quite, quite well. So for about four years or so, a classmate of mine from my undergraduate days and I designed products for a range of customers, including Raytheon. Um, and if, if it didn't give me any satisfaction as an inventor, at least it gave me time, and it gave my partner time to explore ideas. Um, I'm going to take a side trip now and also tell you a little bit about my business education. And for those of you in academia who wonder how guys like me think, or for those of you who are starting to think about businesses of your own, this slide represents my own intellectual journey. So I noticed in 1978 that there were, call it 10 companies in nuclear medicine at the time, dividing a total of $100 million of market between them. No company was especially profitable, and yet each year one or the other of us had a gamma camera that was slightly better in resolution, slightly faster, slightly larger field of view. Um, in 19, from 1973 to 1978, CT went from zero, from being invented, 
to a billion dollars, and it did that in five years. Nuclear medicine had been around in one way or other since the 1940s and had reached $100 million. Well, the difference was that CT made a huge difference. Until CT, it was simply not possible to look inside the brain other than with this horrible pneumoencephalogram, which killed a large number of the patients that were examined and caused intractable headaches and an even larger fraction. Nuclear medicine's main use, on the other hand, had become, by the late 70s, almost entirely in identifying recurrent cancer, something you couldn't do anything about. The word medical outcomes and the words value proposition didn't exist then, but nuclear medicine had very poor value proposition and did not alter outcomes. So this business of not making things better, being able to shed light on a problem which was not clinically actionable, in my view, was what limited the growth of the nuclear medicine market. Now, today, nuclear medicine is used hugely in cardiology, where it does help to improve outcomes. But back in the 70s, it was almost solely focused on cancer. So here's what I learned, that I was this engineering guy without a very strong background in physics. But by reshaping the problem, I was able to compete with all the physicists who couldn't solve the problem. And I did that by asking a better question. This is a very personal lesson. Not how do I fix the physics of the gamma camera, but how do I fix the problem of getting a uniform field? This is a broadly new applied technology. And as I mentioned, my interest in patents ever since that patent has grown steadily because the patent that Raytheon filed, its corporate patent attorneys filed, was weak because they didn't understand the problem and I didn't have the wit to know what I needed to explain to them, because in fact, I didn't know what I needed to explain to them. What I needed to say was something like, we have the first method, the only method, to correct non-uniformity errors in gamma camera. And a good claim one would have said a method comprising um, a system to measure and correct for non-uniformities without specifics of the method. The more specific the patent claim is, the less useful the patent claim the less broad it is. So Raytheon was not able to monetize what has been an invention that, in one way or other, is now used broadly in the field. And you know, it's, it's many years later, and it's still used to this day. So the industry first, poor claim construction. After this experience, I became more involved in crafting patent claims myself. Uh, also, what became clear to me was I got $100 and sales doubled, so our interests weren't aligned. This was a high quality, it was and is a high quality company, but it didn't reward innovation. 20 years to become a vice president is too long, <laughs> really. And then the business lesson was markets which grow rapidly refre reflect strong value propositions, and the opposite is also true. Markets which don't grow reflect weak value propositions. So a few years older now, um, I said, OK, I'm done with medicine. No value propositions for me. And I hated the time I wasn't in medicine, I should tell you. I love being in medicine. But my partner and I started a company, a factory automation company, to do fit and finish inspection. And um, three of us, actually, three of us that started, uh, for many years we didn't speak to each other after the experience. Uh, it wasn't fun. The outcome was about as good as having a job. Uh, my investors made a small profit. And two of them, even though they didn't make a lot of money, they made some. And they liked me enough to see my next venture, which worked out better. The company eventually became and is part of Siemens. Uh, and my <coughs> college classmate friend, with whom I had been friends, close friends for many years, and I didn't speak for 15 years, I'm pleased to say we are friends again. But there's a side lesson of don't go in business with friends. If you value your friendship a lot with someone, keep it not business. Understanding that being a business colleague and being a friend are two different things. At any rate, two of my investors, uh, approached me and said, look, Stan, here's $200,000. Uh, put a little bit of your own money in. And if things work out, we'll put some more in. And you can keep half the company, at least for the first round. So it was really quite an astonishing deal. And I spent the first six weeks being angry at my two co-founders. I was you know, at home and just saying, uh, things would have been better had, I, uh, had they not been the jerks they were. And of course, I was as much a jerk, or maybe more, than they were. Uh, when businesses aren't growing, uh, ours grew to a few million dollars a year. Um, uh, one really begins to ask why that is, and it really crystallized for me in trying to think of what are the things I will look for for anything I do in the future. And I have a credo, a set of beliefs, that one needs to look for markets which are very large, 
for a clear value proposition, one that's easy to articulate. So having thought that I learned the lesson in nuclear medicine, I made the same mistake in factory automation. I, I uh, uh, Articulating value in inspection and to improve quality is as difficult as finding metastatic cancer is in nuclear medicine. And then finally, strong IP, which I did learn, a lesson I did learn from Raytheon. So I'm gonna, so I, I use that then and I use it now as a milestone to judge businesses. And pretty quickly, I landed on a problem in medicine that was clinically important and scientifically overlooked, and that is how to make, how to do a better job at screening for cervical cancer. So cervical cancer was, in, in Western countries, the deadliest cancer in, in women from the beginning of time until the 1940s, and in countries which don't do cancer screening, it still remains the deadliest uh, gynecologic cancer, cancer in women. Uh, pap smear rates by the 19, uh, late 80s now had lowered rates of mortality but with a lot of morbidity, a lot of errors, a lot of excessive procedures that were done, and a lot of procedures that were more extreme than they needed to be because cancers were missed for years. Um, and the thought I had, because I was an imaging guy, I looked at the world through the prism of imaging, was can computerized imaging read pap smears better than humans? So you have to know what a pap smear is. And this is what a tray is. A pap smear is a scraping from the cervix um, of a woman, smeared on a slide, and fixed, stabilized. The cells are stabilized with hairspray, quite, quite remarkably with hairspray. And then the cells are examined under a microscope. Here you can see in this shot that pap smears consist of cells. Well, you can't see them here. You'll see it in the next slide. But here you can see there's a lot of blood and mucus. And peering through the blood and mucus makes looking at pap smears hard and makes errors easy to happen. This is a cluster that's full of abnormal cells. You're looking for big dark nuclei, but because the cells are piled on top of each other and because there's obscuring mucus and white blood cells, in fact, it's tough to find those pre-malignant cells. So the idea was to build, and we did, we built a prototype imaging system. It would raster scan the slides. The software using a very early Macintosh computer would find the big dark nuclei present them in panes for a technologist to examine to be sure that the most suspicious areas of a slide would be reviewed by a technologist. The problem was that overlapping normal cells looked like a cancerous cell, and we, our algorithms couldn't separate them. So this was not good because the money was going away very fast. Um, there were lots of confounders. These were the things we measured, but they were confounded hugely. And we never got, and the call here was that we made a lot of progress, but we, we were never getting as good as humans, not with the computer technology at the time. So we changed the problem, and we said, what if we made a better pap smear? Maybe the computers could read the pap smear better. And this is something called a thin prep, and it was a Saturday afternoon idea of how to make cells in a thin uniform layer. And these cells here, this sample, is from the same biological sample as that earlier one. But the blood and mucus are gone, and it's easy now to see individual nuclei, and it's easy to see which are big and dark, which have um, uh, increased nuclear texture, and which have little light halos around them, which uh, signify an HPV infection. A tray of thin prep slides is perfectly uniform. No matter how much blood and mucus there was in the sample, the, the, the slides themselves are uniform. The principle comes from the French press coffee pot. This is how we make coffee at home. One day, uh, many years ago, I overfilled this thing, put too much coffee in, pressed very hard, and the pot exploded, generally, on the, all over the counter and everything. The, um, the, the principle here is that the pressure differential across the filter is proportional to the coverage of the filter. And once the filter is blocked, you have an infinite pressure difference, essentially, and the thing explodes, or very high at any rate. So um, that principle we applied to a very simple uh, uh, pressure sensor and suction device. We suck cells onto a filter, immersed in a solution containing cells, and as the filter got covered, the pressure differential increased, and we had the exact right number of cells we stopped. That was the breakthrough. People had been trying for 30 years to measure the cellular concentration of suspension, and they'd all been trying to measure individual cells one at a time. Well, when cells stick to each other with blood and mucus, you will surely clog your measuring apparatus. This was an ensemble measurement. We changed the problem. 
Uh, this is the idea that simply the, the relaxation time to equilibrate pressure increases as coverage increases. We built an instrument that sold for 30000 still does, for $30,000. And these little, the plastic cylinder on the right uh, cost a dollar to make and sold for $9.75. So we had pharmaceutical margins on a diagnostic device, which I think was the first time that was true in the history of the diagnostics industry. And the reason we did that was because the pap smears were better. Um, we wound up with a very strong patent, series of patents, I think seven of them, in sample prep. They weren't totally blocking, but with luck, really, and nothing more than luck, they turned out to be better than any other ideas because other people tried to automate pap smears this way but did not achieve our clinical results. The most important part of the story is that because we made a better pap smear, there was a 3x to 4x reduction in screening errors. And now there were hundreds of papers do documenting this uh, without any authors from Cytic on them, really by, by, by third party um, uh, users who, who've done careful clinical trials, as well as the company's own FDA submissions. And in the, not in the first submission, but in the second submission, the FDA, when it approved the device, the uh, supplement to the approval, it called it the first improvement in the pap smear in 50 years. And the company got a label of superior to the conventional pap smear. That label, that claim of superiority, was very important to the business results. Uh, I started the company in my basement in 1987. It went public, and I ran it myself till 1994. It went public in 96. For a period of time, it was the most profitable company in the history of the diagnostics business. The government declared it a monopoly. It's a strange compliment, but it is one. And ultimately uh, was bought, merged with another company for $6 billion. Um, one, it was a one-test company. There were other products, but really it was a one-test company. And just a few months ago, the prototypes were taken into the Smithsonian Museum that my colleagues and I had worked on, you know, uh, all many nights and stuff. Quite a, the, the last bullet is the most remarkable to me and is, is something I still don't quite understand. What I learned was, because I knew nothing at all about pathology, cytology, but I became quite um, committed to learning, and it's one can learn anything. Um, and that's when I started to use this phrase of focusing on clinically important, scientifically overlooked problems as a really good filter for what to work on, as long as it's consistent with the big market, the clear value proposition, and something you can protect. I learned the value of patents here. I learned the value of a strong FDA label. And again, it was a better question. How do, not, how do I get a computer to read pap smears, which is where we started, but how do we make a better pap smear? It was the market. It was the problem that dictated the business, not the, not the technology. I was technology agnostic then, and I am now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit as, as we kind of wrap up here about uh, the next company I started company called Exact Sciences, and uh, it's a company which focused on doing early detection of colon cancer. So colon cancer is the most deadly cancer in men and women in Europe, in the United States, and in, in the industrialized nations of the world if you're a non-smoker. Deadly is cancer. The colon is a huge organ. It's highly enervated, so tugging on it's very painful. It's got a lot of cells, and uh, these are the cells that turn over most rapidly in the body, and every Mitosis is an opportunity for an error in mitosis for uh, a mutation that may be on the chain to cancer to occur. Well, the traditional way of examining the colon is by putting in a colonoscope, and it turns a colon that's shaped like this into something like this, and that's very painful. You have to prep the bowel, which is itself quite a, a, a difficult procedure to undergo, and then uh, this needs to be done under sedation because it is painful. I know this because I did some market research here and was under sedated in my colonoscopy in 1996. Uh, you really have to be committed to do these medical startups. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you have, you're, when properly done, you're quite sedated. You've lost the day, and people don't do them. And that's why colon cancer remains as deadly as it is, even though, in theory, there's a technology that can eliminate it by finding precancerous growths. Well, this was the idea that we had from a stool sample to collect cells like the pap smear, cytology, because those colon cells turn over more rapidly than anywhere in the body. They have to go somewhere, and we thought they went here. We thought they might be preserved. This was an engineering problem. We could deal with this. We could make it 
not offensive to collect and process the sample. And ultimately, we thought that we would lay a clean layer, a thin prep-like layer of cells onto a slide, and uh, that that would make identification of cells uh, very easy, just like reading a pap smear. Um, the problem is, and, and the, the, ra the rationale was that uh, in the lumen, inside the colon, the polyps that become the cancers stick out into the colon, and, and stool, as it goes by, ought to scrape off those cells, and we hoped that if they were intact, that we would be able to recover them and make a prep. We would see the precancerous growth before there was any evidence in the circulation, in the blood, that there was cancer. Find the cancer before it becomes cancer, and you've saved that patient's life. The only problem was it didn't work. The conjecture was wrong. And I also was a few hundred thousand dollars into the thing at this time. So I had read a little bit and thought we could look for mutated DNA. I thought it was a novel idea. It turns out it wasn't. A scientist named Bert Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins, one of the great cancer researchers ever, uh, had the idea first. He published on it in Science in 1992. So I had never really hooked up with an academic before, but we did with him and began a very uh, productive collaboration that continues to this day. It was Bert's idea. Um, and so Bert and his very smart team joined us as scientific co-founders of the company. Resulted in tens of patents. Bert has his own hundreds of patents in, in uh, the molecular basis of cancer, but our, our guys focused on methods patents. Um, and these methods patents are broadly applicable to early detection. The logic behind Bert's work was that a handful of genes are altered initially in a single cell over many, many years. And if that cell and its progeny shed into the colon, you can look at KRAS, you can look at uh, APC mutations, you could look at loss of 5Q. If you have a technology to find a little bit of altered DNA in a sea of a lot of DNA, you can do early detection of cancer. So a lot of, a lot of patents, and, uh, and we really tried to get broad coverage. Um, I, I won't go into the details here, but just tell you what happened. So as a private company, in the years I ran it from 95 to 2001, I took it actually, I did the IPO on this, the company increased very rapidly from a value of 100K to a few hundred million dollars, 200 million dollars. Took the company public in 2001, and I, I retired. I, I didn't stay retired, but I did. Uh, we demonstrated superiority of, of DNA to a blood-based test called fecal occult blood testing but still needed better performance compared to colonoscopy. And this was years later. The company was running out of money, and the company sold the IP that Tony Schuber and I developed for $35 million to Genzyme, which saved the company. Today, the company is in FDA trials, $500 million market cap, and is quite white hot. Uh, and, and its early data, published data, is very exciting. This is the first non-invasive test that, in fact, can find pre-malignant lesions, pre-cancer, with high sensitivity. So again, you can learn anything. I learned the important point that you had been discussing all afternoon um, and, and yesterday of collaborate, don't compete with the academy. This, it changed, setting up that initial collaboration with Vogelstein has become the template for what I've done in the years since then. Uh, I learned the, the real power of the patent portfolio. It saved the company. The company was not gonna succeed. It saved the company. I learned this was uh, not me, but my successor. Um, one of the great risks of um, uh, doing a startup is you spend in front of success. You haven't gotten your FDA approval. You hire a sales force. You haven't gotten your paper published in the New England Journal, but you assume it'll happen any day. And you spend as though it will, and it takes an extra year, and you've spent an extra $20 million or something. And again, back to this business of the better question, which was not how do I make cytology work for the early detection problem, but is there any non-invasive marker for colon cancer? And uh, then the, some of the technical minutiae turned out to be of foundational importance to um, the next thing I worked on, which was, uh, was called next generation sequencing, which is can problems of quantitation be turned into problems of enumeration? I won't harp on that, but just say it was um, a useful insight. Genzyme now owns those, those patents. So here's kind of what I've learned. Um, well, the journey is it's not simple. It takes a long time, and uh, if it sounds, nothing was easy. It was all very hard. The technologies I've worked on in my own patents cover 
a broad range of technology from, from straight ahead electronic in the case of the uniformity correction to electromechanical in the case of the thin prep to tens of patents in molecular biology in uh, weak signal detection and enumeration. Uh, different value propositions in each case, different markets. These are complicated journeys. There's a lot to learn with lots of unexpected turns. So having a strong value proposition helps make your investors forgive you when you make mistakes. The weaker the value proposition, the, more, uh, the less tolerance investors have for, for error, for not being all-seeing. So focusing on important things. And then for me, as an electrical engineer, learning the medicine really was a differentiator for me as an entrepreneur. It really got investors to view me not just as an engineer guy, but as an engineer guy who can get the best people in medicine to work with his companies. Um, in the business of being an inventor, it's really about asking better questions. Uh, and you and your team will invent multiple solutions. These days, I am not much of an inventor myself, but I'm still the guy who asks the questions. And now the people who are in my teams are the inventors. And that's, of course, real leverage. But the business of changing the question is the first step in the inventive act. Um, and understanding competing approaches, because they will help illuminate what you do, is, is very much part of the inventive process. So what I've described, this is my last slide, my journey is sort of the mirror of some of the large-scale things you've discussed. I've told you the story of one guy looking at a series of problems and trying to figure out if it's an important problem and come up with different ways to get to a solution. Um, you need an ecosystem, and you need individual entrepreneur inventors, curious men and women who, who just love solving problems for the joy of it. You have to add to that the discipline of business. Don't work on problems that aren't important. Don't work on markets that aren't big. And don't work on problems that are already solved. So that concludes my remarks. If you have any questions, happy to do that or happy to speak with you out there. Thank you very much. If not, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So there are a lot of people in this room that are thinking about how to modify educational programs yes. to try to promote the kinds of things you're talking about. And I know you've thought about that, yes. too, and didn't mention it. So I wonder if you could just yeah. talk, talk about how you might do things differently. in the So academy. our undergraduate and postgraduate educational system um, I'll, I'll be blunt, I don't think it leads to innovative thinking. I think it, by and large, leads to incremental thinking. All of us have heard criticisms of the science establishment as the projects that get funded are only small steps forward. And one reason is, is we never challenge, especially our graduate students, not our undergraduates, especially our graduate students, we don't ask them the question of this. We don't ask this question. What are important unsolved problems in medicine? If you are a PhD student at MIT, at Harvard, at Johns Hopkins, at Tufts, wherever, that's the one question you never get to ask. You get to ask that when you're senior faculty, maybe. I think programs like this, and this is why I'm part of the faculty here, are designed to get young men and young women of accomplishment thinking about the broadest possible questions. What needs to be solved? That's my answer. Yeah. Very Thanks a lot. Uh, just uh, superb. Uh, when I was a uh, postdoc at the NIH, Julie Axelrod used to sit me down on Friday afternoon, and he used to say, Frank, just ask the simple question. Yeah. You have talked about asking a better question. Yeah. How do you teach people to do either of those two things? Well, uh, we, we have an experiment underway. It's the MVision program. And we'll be able to answer it, perhaps, Frank, with some data and you know, a couple of more <laughs> iterations and a couple of more cohorts as they go through. But I think the first thing you have to do is do Julie Axelrod, is that? Yeah, is do, do what Julie Axelrod said. Ask a simple question. Ask a better question. Uh, I, I've gotten to know a handful of Nobel Prize winners. And that's what they do. The, these are people who 
are beguiling with the simplicity of the questions they ask. How does this work? Why does it work? Um, I, I think that simply a culture that encourages the question to be asked is the first step. Um, and those that have the capability to pose the questions and then answer them will, will go on. But, but our postgraduate system of education doesn't encourage that. It encourages the next small step, the next experiment on the bench. It's very important to do that. It's very important to excel at that. But it's also important to make sure that the young men and women on whom we're counting to, to reduce mortality from 100% to less than 100% do ask those big questions. Great. Thank you very much.